oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Depuis que les libéraux ont, sont arrivés en pouvoir... Since the Liberals took power, housing prices have doubled. According to the Royal Bank, an average paycheck to pay monthly bills for an average house is 60% of that check. That's the highest level in all of our history. And what's the Liberal solution? To triple, triple, triple carbon tax on gas, heating, and groceries. Canadians can't pay more. Will the government cancel its plan to triple the taxes? The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. This gives me the opportunity to talk about the fact that our carbon tax is one of the most effective in the world because it will reduce greenhouse gases, which went down by 9 percent, unlike what we heard on the other side of this House. And 100 percent of revenues generated by the carbon tax are returned to the provinces. 90 percent of households and 10 percent of municipalities and indigenous communities. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Liberals have missed every single emissions target they've set since they put it in. And according to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, the vast majority of Canadians are paying vastly more in carbon tax costs than they get back in rebates, a problem that's about to worsen as the government plans to triple, triple, triple the tax on gas, groceries and heat. Canadians are already cutting back on their diets. Their adults are living in their folks' basement because they can't afford a new house. Will the government cancel this insane plan to triple, triple, triple the tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Seven times. Mr. Speaker, I have a riddle for you. Who said, and I quote, we recognize the most efficient way to reduce our emission is to use pricing mechanism. You could say it's the Minister of the Environment or my friend and colleague, the Minister of Natural Resources, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Minister of Finance, but no, Mr. Speaker, it's the member of Durham, and I agree with him. Pricing mechanism is the most effective way to fight climate change pollution, and he said that in April of 2021, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Tripling a tax at a time like this is not just insane, it is cruel. Right. And this is going to happen even in British Columbia. They have their own tax there, but the federal government, the, the costly coalition of the NDP and Liberals, want to force BC to triple its tax now at a time when gas prices are $2.40 a litre. So once again, for the third time, will they cancel their plan to triple, triple, triple the tax? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, and I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition to allow me this opportunity to talk about the fact that they were getting there next time. Carbon pricing is good. Now, what they wanted to put in place is the principle of pay to pollute. That's not how we do this on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. The principle is pollute or pay, not pay to pollute. Next time when they flip-flop again on carbon pricing, like they've done about 15 times in the last 10 years, they, pricing pollution is good and pollute or pay principle. They, like, they need to go that extra step, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Will there they go. They want to divide and distract. They attacked, they attacked the little old lady living in rural Newfoundland, calling her a polluter for the crime of heating her home in February. According to the Liberal Premier of that province, after the forthcoming increase in the carbon tax, the increased cost of heating the homes of rural Newfoundlanders will have gone up by 80 percent. Worse yet, this government wants to triple, triple, triple the tax. Why won't they axe the tax? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to announce that we have put in, we are putting in place a program to help tens of thousands of Canadians to get off home heating oil. Price of home heating oil is skyrocketing because of the invade, the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, Mr. Speaker. We will put a quarter of a billion dollars to help tens of thousands of Canadians go to clean, efficient.
efficient renewable energy in Canada to heat their homes and save money, Mr. Speaker. Thank Hello. you very much. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Oh, great. Just what we need. A new government program to help us pay the cost of a government tax. Right? <laughs> Don't worry if you live in the countryside of Atlantic Canada, where 40% of people now live in energy poverty after this government has been in power for 70 years. There's a new government program coming. So you need not worry about freezing in the dark as this new tax comes in. That's what they want people to believe. Canadians are not stupid. Canadians are not polluters. They have to heat their homes homes and travel in a big cold right. country, will this government cancel its plan to triple, triple, triple? Hey. climate change is real. And Canadians also understand that the global economy is in the midst of a green transition. It's the biggest transition since the Industrial Revolution. Our government believes we need to help Canadians with the green transition. We need to help Canadian companies like our auto manufacturers, and we need to help Canadian families like those families in Atlantic Canada, which want to get off home heating oil. We're going to help Canadians with climate action because that's the right thing to do. L'honorable député de Trois Rivières, Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker. Deciding to make Roxham Road and all of its facilities permanent raises serious ethical questions. The government has awarded at least seven untendered contracts to two Liberal donors. We don't know if there are more, because the government refuses to disclose all of those contracts. This afternoon, I will be asking the Ethics Committee to look into the ethical aspect of awarding these contracts. If the government has nothing to hide, it should disclose these documents. Will it release all the federal documents related to Roxham Road? The Honourable Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Transparency and accountability are extremely important for our government. Rental contracts were negotiated based on fair value in order to get a competitive price. Revealing confidential contractual information would break the agreements that we have with these providers. We will work with departments and organizations to meet their needs through fair and open contracts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, frankly, we're not talking about top secret documents. We're talking about leases signed for land, trailers, and hotel rooms. By refusing to reveal these contracts for Roxham Road, on, by using questionable excuses, the government is sowing doubt. If the government itself it's the government itself that's bringing to mind the billions of dollars, the billions of dollars that went untendered uh, to the Liberal family during the pandemic. Is it the government? It's the government who's suggesting it has something to hide. Why is the government waiting to be forced to be transparent? Why not just disclose them? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, transparency and accountability are critically important to our government. The rental agreement was negotiated based on fair market value to arrive at a competitive price. Given the location of the land and its proximity to the border, this was an ideal location for CBSA to use for this purpose. Our government is delivering open, fair and transparent procurement processes while obtaining the best value for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Tens of thousands of homes and businesses are still without power in Atlantic Canada after Hurricane Fiona. People have been unable to leave their homes and go to work. They need urgent help as they continue the long recovery. The Atlantic provinces are asking for employment insurance to help people get through this crisis, and so far they've had no response from this government. Will the Liberals do the right thing and move immediately to waive EI rules for Atlantic Canadians so that these families can put food on the table at this critical time. The Honourable Minister for Employment. Mr. Speaker, we understand that serious 
seriousness and the challenges that an Atlantic Canadians are facing when it comes to work right now, and we are there with them on the ground. Service Canada has waived the requirement for a record of employment. We're looking at what we can do to be more helpful. We're on top of this, Mr. Speaker, and I can assure you that we will be there for Atlantic Canadian workers. Honorable Deputy de Rosemont, la petite patrie. Ils l'ont fait pour la Colombie-Britannique. They did it for BC, and now it's time to do it for Atlantic Canada. The Conservative leader is attacking workers to give millions to CEOs. A premium's not a tax, it's an investment in the future. With a recession seemingly inevitable, families will need protection. Workers are at risk of losing their jobs, and the Liberals are dragging their feet on EI. The old regime is letting people down, and the Liberals are doing nothing. We need a modern, effective, accessible system for seasonal and self-employed workers. When will the Liberals wake up? In the middle of a recession? The Honourable Minister of Employment. Our government understands that our EI system needs to be more fair and better adapted to the needs of Canadians. That is why we've committed to completely modernizing the EI system. We have launched the long-term plan to improve the EI system. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Go to around the world over the weekend as hundreds of thousands of people protested against the terrorist regime in Iran. Here in Canada, we're among the biggest protests. But the Prime Minister didn't have the guts to show up because he didn't want to have to explain well, he is why he has failed to criminalize the IRGC, the terrorist arm of the Iranian government, which killed over 50 Canadians when it attacked a civilian aircraft. Will the Prime Minister have the guts to stand in today and announce he's banning this terrorist organization? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. We condemn in the most unequivocal terms the tragic killing of Masa Amini, and we stand with the women, her family and her supporters at this very difficult time. And there needs to be consequences for everyone who was responsible for that killing and indeed all of the transgressions of human rights in Iran, which is why there are tangible consequences, including just last week the Minister of Global Affairs listing the morality piece as one of those parties that will be sanctioned. We will continue to explore all options when it comes to holding those responsible and defending human rights here and around the world. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We don't need symbolic sanctions. We need real action against this terrorist organization, and we need it now. The Minister says he's still exploring, exploring. This terrorist organization murdered over 50 Canadians by shooting down a civilian aircraft over two years ago. This government promised they would ban that terrorist organization not long after that. They still haven't done it. It is perfectly legal for that group to raise money, organize logistics on Canadian soil after it killed our people. What kind of prime minister fails to stand up for his own citizens after they've been murdered? Why won't he stand in his place today and ban this group? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, what is happening in Iran is completely unacceptable. This is the regime that is persecuting women. This is the same regime that decided to uh, down fight PS752. Therefore, we are sanctioning the RGC's core leadership. We are imposing new sanctions. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? We will do more because more needs to be done. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Friday morning, in my riding, I attended an event and attended the inauguration of the community fridge. These events were connected to food assistance. Many families in Quebec and Canada are facing challenges. Everybody needs to eat, but not everybody has the money to do so. Is the government aware of this reality? And could they do the bare minimum, which is to not increase taxes? The Honourable Minister of Family. Mr. Speaker, we understand that costs of living for families are high. 
That's why in 2015, we introduced the Canada Child Benefit. From 2015, it has raised 450,000 children in this country out of poverty. Mr. Speaker, we are there for families. We have been there for families, and we will be there for families. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about the basics, food, pe families in need, people who used to be able to give food but now have to take it. We are a G7 country, and food banks aren't enough. And what does this government want to do? Increase taxes. Can this government have a heart and understand that the Liberal carbon tax is no, no, no? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand very well that Canadian families are experiencing trouble. That is why we are going to increase payments to ease the burden of inflation. These measures will give $500 to Canadian families. Now is the time for Conservatives to support our plan for dental care for children and housing payments. That's real support. New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, there are two constants with this Liberal government. Liberals have never seen a tax they do not like. They have never seen a tax they will not hike. Conservatives know that a dollar left with Canadians is better than in the hands of the politicians who taxed it. So will this government cancel its plan to triple, triple, triple its carbon tax on groceries, gasoline and home energy fuels? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, um, I know Matt is not the Conservative Party of Canada's forte. Uh, I don't understand how going from $50 to $65 is a tripling, 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 Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Triple. This government will triple the tax on gasoline, triple the tax on energy, and make everything Canadians buy more expensive. Liberals don't have a plan for the environment. They have a bone-crushing tax plan. The carbon tax is costing families more and more each day. Canadians know it. A carbon tax is a tax on everything. The Liberals are pushing Canadians to the brink of financial dissolution with their high-tax agenda. Will the government cancel its plans to tax gasoline, energy, and home energy fuels? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fact, BC has had a price on carbon for the last 10 years. Their pollution level has gone below 2007 level. Quebec, 3% below their 1990 levels since they've had a price on pollution. The European Union, 24% below their 1990 level. They've had a price on pollution for the last 15 years. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the parliamentary budget officer said that Canadians would be getting more money from pricing on carbon this year, next year, the year after that, and the year after that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Quebec's tourism industry is sounding the alarm. The decision to end temporary EI measures without a comprehensive reform is putting Quebec's regions at risk. Imagine being a seasonal worker. Ten days ago, you qualified at 420 hours, and now, suddenly, you have to accumulate 700 hours. We're talking about entire industries and regions where it's exceptional to go over 500 hours in a season. This is a betrayal of workers. Will the minister rectify the situation before it's too late? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That is exactly why we've decided to extend the pilot project for seasonal workers. And that's why we have committed to completely modernizing the EI system in Canada. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, if the tourism industry is sounding the alarm, it's because it's threatened. It's afraid of losing its workers, like all seasonal industries in Quebec. If the federal government deprives employees of employment insurance this winter, how many will be able to come back next summer, do you think?
And if employees don't come back, where will they find replacements in the middle of a labor shortage? When will the minister finally understand that by putting workers in misery, she's dragging seasonal workers down too? The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand the specific issues of seasonal workers, and that is why we extended our seasonal worker pilot project. That's why we are working on modernizing EI. We will always be there to support workers. The Honorable Member for Therese de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, pilot projects are not resolving eligibility criteria. By reverting to old EI rules without a reform, the minister is jeopardizing not only workers but also employers, and the result is a perfect recipe, a recipe for regional decline. First, deprive workers of EI to force them to change jobs or move. Then, deprive entrepreneurs of labor and push them towards closure. This is how Quebec's regions are losing their vitality. Does the minister realize what She's aiding and abetting. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, of course, we are always there for workers. We've made many changes to the EI system, including extending from 15 to 26 weeks sick leave benefits. We're working on modernizing the EI system as a whole, and I will have more details soon. Super. Super. The Honourable Member for Regina Louvan. Because of Liberal incompetence, the average Canadian family pays more in taxes than they spend on food, shelter and clothing combined. Right. Families across the country are struggling to just get by, and this out-of-touch government just doesn't care. Our people need a break. So on behalf of Canadians, will the Prime Minister cancel his triple Triple, triple tax hike on gas, groceries, and home heating. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we absolutely understand that Canadians today are struggling with the cost of living. And that's why we have put forward a plan to give vulnerable Canadians a, G a double GST tax rebate. That will mean nearly $500 for Canadian families. 11 million Canadian households will get that support. And I'm really glad that the Conservatives have come around and support this important here, here. plan. Now is the time for them to also support Canadians struggling to pay their rent with our program and to support Canadian kids under 12 with dental care. Here, here. Right well, member for Regina Louvan. What an arrogant and condescending response. That rebate will be eaten up by home heating costs in a week, Mr. Speaker. Canadians need much more help. It's too little, too late. As we near the coldest months of the year, this incompetent Liberal government is tripling, yes, tripling the tax on gas, groceries and home heating. Yeah. Canadians will have to decide between heating their homes and buying ha help healthy food for their family. So my question is simple. When will this out-of-touch government stop triple, triple, triple taxing Canadians? The Honourable Minister for Family. Mr. Speaker, I see the Conservatives are doubling down on their bad math today. Um, but let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. in partnership with the government of Saskatchewan, where that member is, is helping families right now. In fact, the government of Saskatchewan announced through the Canada-wide Early Learning and Child Care Initiative that they have reduced child care fees by up to 70 percent, Mr. Speaker, well ahead That's of great. schedule. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, that helps families with the high cost of living, it whether sure it's does. buying nutritious food, getting winter clothes, whatever it is that they need, we are helping families. I hope that the member offers that knows that we and the government... The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's reported that one in six small businesses are having such a tough time they're considering closing. Oh, restaurants okay. Canada reports 85% of restaurants have taken on new debt. And yet the Liberal government defends forcing payroll tax increases 
on small businesses. The Associate Minister of Finance said small businesses on payroll tax increases, quote, can afford this. And the Finance Minister herself admitted that raising EI premiums will bring in an extra $2.5 billion. Will the government end their planned tax hikes on small businesses? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Opposite for her questions and for her persistence on this issue about supporting small businesses. We share that persistent prioritization. What we've been doing for the past two and a half years is supporting small businesses through the pandemic with targeted wage supports and supports for rent. What we've been doing since the pandemic is we've launched a women's entrepreneurship strategy, a blank entrepreneurship strategy, and we're empowering Indigenous businesses. We know that the power of small businesses will be unleashed through inclusive growth, and that is what we are prioritizing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker. Canadians are suffering and even dying because getting help for their mental health isn't affordable and wait lists are months or even years long. This week is Mental Illness Awareness Week and mental health organizations are once again calling for this government to recognize there is no health without mental health. During the last election, the Liberals promised to spend $4.5 billion over five years to expand mental health services and address backlogs. They still haven't delivered. So when will the Liberals follow through on their funding promises to improve mental health services for struggling Canadians? The Honourable Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question and the ongoing advocacy, particularly in this Mental Illness Awareness Week. Mental health is health, as he said, and our government has made mental health a priority. And since 2015, we've made historic investments to support the $5 billion to the provinces from 20 2017, $600 million every year still ongoing, almost $600 million for distinctions-based mental health and wellness strategy for Indigenous people. We know that we need to do more, and we will do more. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are clawing back the Canada Child Benefit from parents who needed pandemic supports. But you know what they're not clawing back? The wage subsidy from corporations that gave out executive bonuses or shareholder dividends, like Air Canada, who got $554 million and gave out $10 million in bonuses, or Imperial Oil, who got $120 million and paid out $324 million in dividends. Why are the Liberals clawing back child benefits from single moms trying to feed their kids while letting big corporations off the hook? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely believes in supporting Canadian children and Canadian families. That is why we have worked so hard to put a national program on early learning and childcare in place that is going to help families with affordability help our economy. That is why the Canada Child Benefit, which has lifted hundreds of thousands of Canadian children out of poverty, is such an important program. And Mr. Speaker, we know that everyone in Canada has to pay their fair share. That is why we are imposing a COVID recovery dividend on our banks and insurers. Here, here. Member for Mississauga Malton. Mr. Speaker, in my writing of Mississauga Malton, rent and housing costs have risen for so many, especially working individuals, families, and our most vulnerable. They need help and they need it immediately. Can the Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion please tell this House what our government is doing to help renters and those struggling with the cost of housing through this difficult time? The Honourable Minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Mississauga Malton for his important question on hard work on this important file. We know that the cost of uh, affordable rent is increasingly out of reach for many Canadians. That's why we introduced legislation to introduce a one-time uh, top-up of $500 that will help 1.8 million renters and is on top of the already existing average $2,500 as part of the Canada Housing Benefit. I urge Conservative members to stop getting in the way and help us to pass this important legislation so that we can get this important rent relief to Canadians as soon as possible. The Honourable Member for North Okanagan, Shuswap. Constituents in BC are tired of this government cutting into their paychecks. Yes, they are. Yet mm -hmm. the Prime Minister plans to triple, 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 triple. No. the carbon tax, raising yeah. fuel, heat, and grocery costs, 
and increased paycheck t taxes killing jobs. Shameful. The finance minister even admits the money will not go into EI. What? It will go to cover out of control government spending. That's shocking. Their paycheck taxes will take 2.5 billion extra out of the hands of hard-working Canadians. Incredible. Will the government end their planned tax hikes on Canadians' paycheck? Uh, yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's really important for us to be clear and honest with Canadians about their pensions and about EI. Right now, at a time of real uncertainty and volatility in the global economy, it would be the height of irresponsibility to cut our contributions to the Canada Pension Plan and to EI. Too many Canadians depend on both. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, our government is absolutely committed to supporting Canadian seniors, to supporting the Canadian workers who depend on EI. Excellent. Yeah. Member for Abbotsford. The inflation crisis in BC is exploding. It's not only food and shelter costs that are taking a hit. Vancouver's gasoline prices are now the highest in North America. Yet the Prime Minister wants to force BC to triple the carbon tax on everything, making life completely unaffordable for families. While the Prime Minister fiddles around, life has become hopelessly expensive and Canadians are now losing hope. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister now cancel his plan to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax on gas, groceries and home heating? Yes or no? Speaker, I think we're all really glad to hear today from the member for Abbotsford, who is an MP we all know and respect. And so I listened to him carefully during the campaign when he said, quote, I'm deeply troubled by suggestions by one of our leadership candidates that that candidate would be prepared to interfere already at this stage in the independence of our central bank. So I wonder if the member for Abbotsford has persuaded his new leader to see the wisdom of his previous comments. Good here, here. The Honourable Member for Kootenai, uh, Columbia. Mr. Speaker, the tax and spend government plans to raise the carbon tax from the current level of $50 a tonne to $170 a tonne by 2030. British Columbians are already stretched thin by an out-of-touch government who is now asking BC to triple its carbon tax, making life even more unaffordable. Mr. Speaker, will the government back down from forcing BC to triple, 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 triple. their carbon tax on gas, groceries and home heating? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier during this question period, I referred to the member for Durham who spoke about the benefit of pricing carbon to fight pollution. I would also like to refer to the member of New Brunswick Southwest who also urged his Premier, and I quote, to adopt the federal system because checks will be rolling out to New Brunswick families. That's exactly right, Mr. Speaker. We can work to fight pollution, work to fight climate change, and help Canadian families. I agree with the member from New Brunswick Southwest, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, this government remains out of touch with reality. With an increase of more than 10% in food prices and the absurd tripling of the carbon tax by this government, things can only get worse, not to mention the 35% tax on fertilizers, which many farms have not yet recovered from. Farmers want help to feed our families with safe and nutritious food, but their inputs have only gone up under this government. Will the government stop its plan to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax on Canadian farmers? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, and I know it's a bit complicated, but the price on pollution, the federal price, does not apply to Quebec because Quebec has its own system of cap and trade. We decided to respect that, as we did with all other provinces that wanted to have their own system for pricing pollution. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Avignon, la Métis, Matan, Matapédia. 
Mr. Speaker, again last night in Montreal, shots were fired right in the middle of the city and a body was found in the trunk of a burnt-out car. The situation keeps getting worse. This year will beat last year for shootings, even though last year was the worst in a decade. Mr. Speaker, the first step in fixing a problem is to acknowledge its existence. The problem is illegal guns coming across the border. Does the minister realize he hasn't come up with any effective measures at the border to control this traffic? The Honourable Minister. Our thoughts, uh, first and foremost, go out to the families of the victims. Uh, it's very painful time. We've invested heavily in strengthening security at the borders. And we're bringing criminals to justice who've attempted to import illegal weapons. It's a problem. It's a, there are a lot of challenges, but we will continue with our plan. And our, our legislation will stiffen penalties for organized crime. We have to pass that bill as quickly as possible. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamitis Matan Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, not much progress. There are 1,100 guns seized at the borders last year, but at the same time in Montreal and Toronto, 2,500 guns were seized, more than twice as many. This proves guns are crossing our borders and reaching our cities. Last year, Yves Francoeur from the Police Brotherhood said on Tout le monde en parle that it's become all too common to catch young people with illegal weapons that they've bought for themselves for self-defense because they're living in fear. That's what gun culture is all about. The more guns there are out there, the more you need one. It's a vicious, it's a vicious circle. Does the minister realize that this culture is expanding on his watch? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my colleague. We have to break that cycle. And that's why we will continue to invest in cooperation with Quebec, $40 million to support police, uh, as well as $18 million to prevent gun violence in Montreal. And we have to go even further with Bill C-21 with more resources. And we're going to do that work in cooperation with the Bloc. Thank you very much. Hill. This weekend, millions around the world protested the brutal dictatorship in Iran demanding freedom. Students at Tehran Sharif University are being brutalized and arrested by the regime. 50,000 people came together in Richmond Hill to, to demand the IRGC be listed as a terrorist organization, and the Prime Minister didn't even bother to respond to the invite. MPs passed a motion in this House almost four years ago to designate the IRGC as terrorists. We need actions, not words, broad sanctions, not a free pass. What time today will the government list the IRGC as a terrorist organization in this country? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Obviously, we're standing with the courageous women and all the people of Iran who are standing up and fighting for their freedom, and I must say also for their future. That is why I raised that very issue not only at the only at the UN last uh, Monday, but also when I was at, in Washington on Friday at ICAO and over the weekend also with key Iranian women. This morning we met also with the families of flight PS 752. We will make sure to hold accountable the regime for this. We've imposed sanctions. We'll do more. We, we will be imposing new sanctions very soon, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, the virtue signaling of this government's fake feminist foreign policy needs to stop. Projecting lights on the building of parliament isn't going to punish the brutal dictatorship's morality police from killing women. It won't get justice for the victims of 752. The government has failed Iranian Canadians. It has failed to protect the freedom of women demanding it. It has failed to stand up against the tyrants in Tehran. Will they finally list the IRA? RGC as terrorists today. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is not a partisan issue. We are all together in denouncing what is happening in Iran. And I really hope I can work with my colleague on this and with all the members of the opposition, because of course we're united in making sure to hold accountable the perpetrators of this awful
powerful regime. We want to make sure that we do things right. I'm going to interrupt the honourable member. I appreciate some honourable members trying to practice their French during question period, but not while somebody's speaking. It's just not parliamentary. Uh, the the honourable par par uh, minister, please, from the top, so we can all hear your answer. So from the top. Uh, sorry. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, this is a very important question for Canada. We want to make sure that we work all together in this House because, indeed, we need to make sure that this is not a partisan issue. Exactly. This is a question of making sure that those perpetrators are held accountable at the international level. We need to make sure that we work all together on this. We will work with other countries in the world and those who are going against those women, including those who are responsible for the killing of Gina Massa Amini, will make sure that they're the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, the Minister speaks about us being all together. We were all together four years ago when Liberals voted with Conservatives to immediately list the IRGC as a terrorist entity. This Minister, this Prime Minister, the entire Cabinet voted for my motion to list the IRGC four years ago to immediately list them, and yet they didn't do it. That's the problem, Mr. Speaker. We have more empty words from the minister, and yet we have four Shame. years of complete inaction. PS752 didn't move them to action. The murder of Masa Amini still hasn't moved them to action. We need to replace hollow words with real action. It's a... The Honourable oh. Minister. Mr. Speaker, in the face of the atrocious violations of human rights, this government has taken concrete action by ensuring that the state is listed as a supporter of terrorist activity, by listing the IRGC Kuds force because it is a purveyor of terrorism, Mr. Speaker, and by last week ensuring that we sanction the morality piece who are responsible uh, for the killing of Masa Amini. We need to be united on this, and we need to take— I'm just going to interrupt the honourable member. The honourable member will ask the question, then shouts while well, the answer is coming back. I just want to remind him that if he wants to hear the answer, he's going to have to stop shouting. We'd appreciate it if he stopped shouting while I'm speaking as well. The Honourable Minister from the top. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I was saying, when it comes to the atrocious human rights violations and in the face of that action, we have taken concrete action, including ensuring that Iran is listed as a state suborner of terrorism, ensuring that we list the IRGC Quds Force, ensuring that last week that we sanction the members of the Morality Police who are responsible for the killing of Masa Amini. Mr. Speaker, we will never stop defending human rights when it comes to this side of the House. We need to be united on that, not play partisanship. Thank you. Honourable Member for London West. Mr. Speaker, protecting all Canadians is a top priority for our government. This means working for a criminal justice system that's effective, fair, and above all, compassionate toward victims. Given the importance of having a strong voice to represent victims, can the Minister of Justice tell us more about the recent appointment of the Ombudsman for Victims of Crime? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the member for London West for her question and her excellent work. I was indeed very proud to announce the appointment of the new Ombudsman, Benjamin Roebuck, a recognized expert who's done over 15 years of research in the field of victimology. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to support victims in our justice system in every way possible, be it through our investment in agencies that assist them, a new and particularly capable ombudsman, or, Mr. Speaker, by allowing the resources of our system to be used to fight serious crime. Mr. Speaker, our government will always be there for victims. The Honourable Member for Charleswood St. James of Sinaboya, Headingley. Mr. Speaker, Masa Amini is dead for the high crime of showing her hair. Tomorrow marks 1,000 days since the IRGC shot down Flight 752, killing 55 Canadians. The U.S. declared the IRGC to be a terrorist organization over three years ago. Sanctioning a few individuals today doesn't go nearly far enough. It's time to send the tyrants in Tehran a clear message. When will this government wake up, see the IRGC for what it is, and finally list this horrible terrorist entity. Yeah. The 
Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to take concrete action to ensure that no one, whether you're from Iran or any place in this world, who violates human rights, who commits acts of terrorism, who commits the kind of brutal killing of Masa Amini or any other woman or any other member of a vulnerable group, will have safe haven in this country. We will ensure that those who are responsible are sanctioned, and we will continue to explore all options to defend human rights here and around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Mr. Speaker, we are talking about murder. Surely that, uh, that deserves more than simple, empty words from the minister opposite. We are talking about a 22-year-old Iranian woman who was killed because she neglected to wear her hijab properly. The entire world is watching. Canadians are calling for action. And this government has empty platitudes to offer. Surely we can do better. Surely. I am calling on this government. I am asking them on behalf of Canadians. When will the IRGC be determined a terrorist organization? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I agree with my colleague and our outrage regarding what's going on in Iran. For all the Masa Aminis in the world, we need to stand up, and we are standing up. That's why we are sanctioning the RCG, and we are sanctioning the key leaders, the perpetrators behind this tragedy and these atrocities. But indeed, we need to make, do more. We need to shed light on what is going on in Iran. We need to stand with the courageous women that are fighting for their future. And we are. And I hope that I will work with, be count, I can count on my colleague. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government will never cease to amaze us. After coming to power in 2016, they removed sanctions against Iran, and then, in response to the murders and torture committed by Iran's Revolutionary Guard, the Prime Minister decided to bring back sanctions, saying the Revolutionary Guards have committed egregious acts. Egregious acts as a way for the Liberals to avoid using words like murder of innocent and defenseless women, men and children. When will the Prime Minister list the IRGC as a terrorist organization? The Honourable Minister. What's going on in Iran is totally unacceptable. That regime is persecuting women, and they also created the uh, tragedy of the passenger jet that was shot down. And that's why we've imposed stiff sanctions, and we will continue to impose new ones. And I hope my colleague will stop playing petty partisan politics, because this is the type of situation that requires the House to be unanimous, and I hope they will work with us. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, last week the Health Committee heard conclusively from experts that pediatric dental care is part of the overall children's health plan. The president of the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario stated that they have kids in pain because they can't get dental surgery, the part of it that they would see, with seven-eighths of them not getting that surgery on time. Mr. Speaker, why is it that the Conservatives want to obstruct kids from receiving a benefit that would prevent the burden of dental disease? Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health please tell this House the importance of passing C-31 so that children can get the treatment that they need this year for good oral health? Yeah, yeah. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Guelph for his consistent advocacy, particularly on health-related matters for his constituents in Guelph. I was at that meeting last week, Mr. Speaker, and according to the Canadian Dental Association, over 2.26 million school days a year are missed because kids are getting uh, tooth decay and, and other tooth-related matters fixed at their dentist, and fully one-third of day surgeries uh, accounted for uh, by surgeries for kids between one and five for their teeth. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, the burden of dental diseases is concentrated in those from low-income families, Indigenous children, new immigrants, and children with special health-related needs. So by putting this benefit in place, our government is taking action. So when will the Conservative... Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, energy workers in Western Canada are frustrated because this government has no credible plan for a just transition. Now, compared to Joe Biden, 
who is transforming the American economy with massive investments in clean tech to create what he calls good paying union jobs. But this Prime Minister has missed every single climate target. He's shown no vision for the incredible potential of a clean energy economy. So my question to the Environment Minister is, will this government put the necessary money on the table to create a clean energy future for Canadian workers and their families? Here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the business of lowering emissions is a complex one. It requires people with talent and determination and ingenuity that will lead and build the energy industries in this country. Energy workers will build CCUS. They will build up lower carbon fuels and hydrogen, and we cannot get to net zero without them. We are delivering strategic investments in skills and training and regional strategies and projects right across Canada that will create sustainable jobs. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back in April, even before this government approved the Baden Ore drilling, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres pointing out that we are on track to more than double the 1.5 degree Paris target, said this, and I quote, some government leaders are saying one thing and doing another. Simply put, they are lying, close quote. Since 1990, our emissions have risen more than any other G7 country. When Antonio, Antonio Guterres said some government leaders are lying, which country's leaders do we think they are referencing? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, thank you. And I thank my Honourable Member for, for her colleague and her dedication to the issue of climate change over many decades. As the IPCC has said, countries need to be reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40 3% by 2030, we're on track to meeting at least 40% reduction and on our way to meeting 45% reduction, Mr. Speaker. We are doing more right now than any other country in the G7 to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Our investment on a per capita basis are three times what the Americans just announced with the IRA in the U.S. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Excellent. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today for our question. Please give it to Dr. I see a member rising on a point of order, the Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, there have been consultations among parties, and I believe you will find the unanimous consent of the House for the following motion, that the House stand in solidarity with the people of Iran fighting for their freedom against Iran's tyrannical dictatorship and those protesting the brutal murder of Massa Amini at the hands of the morality police because she dared to confront the Iranian regime and fight for her freedom, and B, expressed its disappointed, disappointment that the action was not taken by the government on June 12, 2018, motion adopted by this House calling for the IRGC to be listed as a terrorist organization, and once again call upon the government to list the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corp as a terrorist organization in Canada. All those opposed to the honourable member moving the motion will please say nay. No, no we don't. We don't have unanimous consent. It being at 3:14, pursuant to order made on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, the House will now proceed to.